we have $700 of travel funds if we're not presenting, and that's for professional development and so on, and then 1000 if we're presenting. But the money can be used for professional development, and this is professional development. So if anybody who has $500 of travel funds available, can it can be used for the certification uh, training that we're involved with so that you can be added to the the memorandum that, or the agreement, the contract that we have with have the money. So that's why. That's what we're. Yeah, that's uh -huh. why when we asked the dean for you whether you can do the same thing, uh -huh. and she said yes. So you're you've got it uh, covered. Ricky is working on it for you, for the online course. But the next step now is to get you integrated with this training. Gotcha. May two. Uh, so let's move to the everybody who paid the fees, Martha, then was asked to develop little subgroups. So the subgroups right now, uh, Maria, that Maria, Teresa, and uh, Aisha are on one subgroup. Um, the Helen, Patsy, Maria T, and Lynn are another subgroup. Uh, George and uh, Kathy are another subgroup. Daniela and Angela, uh, Joyce and Lynn, and uh, Barbara Johnson, the principal here, who's in here. Mickey, uh, now it's going to be Maria as uh, well. And I'm with them on that group. So, what, what I'd like to. Uh, Said to uh, May, who is which, 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 she's over there. Oh, okay, she uh, Meg, even though you haven't uh, uh, paid the fees, I'm still pushing to have everybody in the community be involved, and then we can, we can figure out after the fact. So, May, is there a oh, Shar, Shar is and um, Eva are even though Eva, not yet, they're a group. No, but so, uh, is there any one of those groups you want to join? Well, uh, didn't they already complete their... No, don't worry about completing. No, don't worry about completing. Which, which group do you want to join? No, look at you. Okay, look at you. And as uh, Martha, you think of a uh, reread them for you. Which group do you want to join? How come? I think I need to work with Daniela. Daniela and Angela. There you got your partner. Okay. So you guys are still thinking two box like Meg. Sport no, physical not, activity no, stretches I'm across not. the globe. I'm We've got the World Cup coming up. The authorization. I know that I could learn something from every single one of these groups. Oh, good comeback. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what I'm signing up for. <laughs> All I know is that, um, yeah, so I'm just going to go with my impulses here. <laughs> 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 Are you going to? I didn't know what I was doing. No, it's in our group. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. You're allowed to say no. All right, Meg, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Joyce and Lady. It's like this is a race. It's a race. All right. Yeah, I was trying to give you some Hi, friends. So. Okay. I understand. Okay. okay. <laughs> now, the next step. Next step, guys. We're going. I'm going to continue doing this for uh, the two of the others that like or other Gwen, not to get a hookup. So Martha, once we had the subgroup. Each subgroup was asked, those questions you have? No? Yes. We were asked to get together and then uh, go through those questions in any format that the group felt necessary to do it. And the plan is that each group is going to share with Michelle 
your responses to those okay. questions. So if you choose to write it up or do it to, in any other fashion, but you're going to share them. The purpose of the large group today is really for her to get a feel for the whole group talking about. Got it. So if we're going to look at the items one through eight, as suggested uh, by on your hand now, um, would you guys choose two of those questions that we could uh, dig into for the remainder of today so she can hear us chatting? And Kathy, you get to choose since you were earlier here. Since I made a suggestion. <laughs> That's right. So one through eight, which uh, two Questions we've got we're at one fifteen now. Okay. So uh, <laughs> I choose three. You choose three and we need another one. We need another one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Four. Eight. Four. Oh, you want four? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. If you get what are your choices? We you hear Kathy wants three. Eight. Eight? No, four. I hear a four and an eight. We can have three and then split the ten, so mm -hmm. So four, three, four, and eight. All right. So George, would you be the leader on question three? Um, uh, Char, would you be the leader? Did you say four or eight? I Char? said four. All right. You be the leader on four. And who proposed eight? Lynn. Lynn. <laughs> Lynn. Lynn. All right. <laughs> Lynn, you're yeah, but Martha doesn't have an yeah, answer. You don't have the answer. You're the leader for the discussion. So George, you got us in your hand. The question, uh, question on the table. We've got George. You've got at least uh, twelve minutes. That's uh, say for the, each of the questions. So, so, so the idea. I guess, so the idea would be that we got to show some time. Wait, wait, George. We got some time. Right? We've got to show Michelle that we're listening with understanding. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. So, so we need to split the time so so that uh, as many uh, groups can be involved in this conversation. Um, so, uh, if we can have a volunteer from one of our groups to start the conversation, um, such as, so I'm a blank educator. How do the habits of mind fit my subject? And, and sort of get on the table some of the things about your group. You want to start? but I feel like I was impulsively acting because somebody else wanted an opportunity. You've got to get going and everyone will have a shot. Okay. 12 minutes. Uh, the reason I wanted to jump in is because, well, I have literacy as my subject area and I feel like that is integrated with everything and so are the habits of mind. The habits of mind are their intelligent behaviors and characteristics of successful people. So how could they fit every subject area? And I'd like to go back to that um, it's in our handout, but it's also in the book. So that was one of the other reasons I wanted to share. It always reminds me of the, the right, because it shows that any content area fits the habits of mind, that you pick the task, the cognitive tasks, you need the thinking skills that go with that content area. So for literacy, our cognitive task for reading and writing, there are always the thinking skills that go with it, and of course, it's in habits of mind, so that, that was, I, I had the book as evidence, and that's why I thought maybe I would go first. But. So that, the four levels of educational outcomes that is in the, the Costa and Binnick uh, book that yes. you're sharing with everyone. Right. Um, so, uh, any reactions to that? Because some of you may be feeling the same way, that you re reacted that, that that's a good point. Can, can some other group share? Sure. It shows you this. <laughs> George and I just recently presented at NSTA, National Science Teachers Association, a national conference. And what our presentation was on was, was using the science standards and connecting them with the habits of mind. And, and in our presentation, we did very similar things that we had on our, our um, PowerPoint before. But um, we had a group of 15 people, which was surprising because only because it was a cold, windy day, and they had to travel from the main convention center three blocks over to where we were giving our presentation. But <coughs> what we did was, and I, this, I made a copy of this. This is the result. 
for the new generation science standards, there are eight practices that the whole standards are focused on, what they want students to know and be able to do. It's K through 12. K through 12. And then what we did was we matched each one of these with our habits of mind. So we wanted to show the relationship not only between the old standards, but or the the new standards, but also we listed the the older standard, which people are familiar with, the process skills. And we wanted to show them how they all blend together. And it was interesting that a number of people were involved in using the habits of mind and, and interested in how to incorporate them in their in their uh, schools. Yeah, these are primary K through 12. Uh, science teachers and the thing that, that we did with them was the cube activity which was centered around the nature of science so so in terms of us coming away learning something was that a lot of a lot of the uh, other 15 teach, uh, <coughs> teachers there a lot of them came they wanted to be there and they're doing habits of mind in their schools across the country and that was good to hear and then they also identified with these connections and helped us identify the connections of the new standards with the habits of mind so that that, that, that was a personal you know, satisfaction of learning from the group in that way. Would another group like to um, share? We still are in the 12 minute zone. <laughs> I, want to, I want to add something that, that kept popping up in the materials that I was looking at was that um, the focus on, well, I'm in literacy education. So I have content, and I want students to get the right answers or get correct answers for the content, but that um, it's the habits of mind help with the process and procedures leading to the content, so I can understand why the need visible thinking, mm -hmm. because I think as a teacher, um, the thinking curriculum is a hidden curriculum until we give it labels, until we, until we label the concepts and help the students gain control over those concepts because um, like taking persistence, as a human being, the, a person in our classroom has been persistent sometime in their life. They had to open a jar or to do something, right? But they may not have the awareness of how that could apply to literacy or to the, the subject area. So by helping give the, the habits of mind, helping make them explicit, and then working them into the dialogue of the classroom and so on, that it's essential for my curricular area to make that curriculum visible. Yeah. From the early childhood perspective. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, well, our postdoc says that the habits of mind seem to be uh, attributes to good problem solvers. So kids are always finding uh, problems, which is beautiful at that age. So we want uh, to uh, we want to prepare our teachers to value that and to help them continue valuing the children's uh, natural curiosity. So many habits of mine are really creativity, questioning, uh, something that's amazing with kids is uh, the awe, oh, the wonderment that they always have. So uh, we also align, um, uh, we align this question with uh, concentric circles because uh, in early childhood we also have a standards and things that we have to follow, that, so that falls under the content. And uh, in my courses, uh, the curriculum courses that I'm teaching, uh, we want, uh, I help, or I work with the students, helping them uh, reflect with these circles, trying to identify the content that they are uh, using, and the type of thinking that they think that the students will need in order to perform something, and then, the visible thinking provide a lot of uh, strategies that, that help the children achieve that. And uh, after what they do that, we always go back to the habits of mind and try to understand how the, the kids were uh, reaching those uh, habits of mind. But with the kids, we are, uh, with the teachers and kids, it's, it's like a domino sequence. We want uh, the teachers to teach the children uh, the different habits of mind, but we want the teachers to internalize them, them first. So. Uh, that's what we are trying to do. Georgia, in our, our group, it's Mick and Barbara, and we took a more generic approach to that question. And so, and, and Mick, you, 
Vinci. I think we approached it from the more philosophical side, that content is not an end in and of itself. So we didn't go to the specific field we went across to suggest then, like uh, Lynn was showing the nested outcomes model, if content is not an end in and of itself, then it means that it's being used for some larger purpose. And that larger purpose leads you to the task. And the task gets grounded then in learning from the world around me. And to do that, the content can be science, history, etc. And therefore, uh, knowledge becomes interdisciplinary. As, as the vehicle toured the uh, land. And as a result, in fact, as we were chatting, um, it became obvious we probably should ask Art and Benna whether they want to change the model because then move the task at the bottom end rather than at the inside. You see, at the bottom end of the model is the content. Mm -hmm. And it still looks as though you have to go to the content first. But if you put the task there as the, as the catalyst, and then I draw on the content and skills, and the larger parameter becomes then the guiding habits of mind. Like but, 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 Nick, you, you, you Well, um, whatever you all said is the bottom line is it doesn't matter what subject you're teaching, what age your students are. If they're trying to decode a word and they come to one that's not familiar, it's a problem. They can draw on the habits of mind and use them as thinking mm -hmm. strategies. If they're trying to solve a math problem and they try, one solution doesn't work, they're looking for another strategy. So we took a more general approach and said it doesn't really matter what you teach. We can give specific examples from each discipline, but given that, no matter who you are or where you are, when you're struggling, the habits can come in, use, come in and be very useful. Well, mind if I chime in here? We, we took a kind of a different approach to it because in the literature, um, way back when we were doing the, the, the book, it was, I, I basically found, other than what was mentioned on the um, habits of Mind website about physical activity and the Habits of Mind, even though it can go across curriculum, it hasn't really been embraced. Um, there was one chapter in Teaching the Habits of Mind Across Curriculum book in which a physical educator talked about how she used the Habits of Mind with her classes. So... This is a book, sure. I have that, yeah, uh, across the curriculum. So, um, so what was interesting is when we started thinking about it, a lot of the habits are the things that, that are necessary for any type of movement um, and any type of adherence to any type of exercise patterns. Except when we started thinking about it, the habits of mind have been taught in our area, but they haven't been, they haven't been um, put together as the habits of mind, right? They haven't been referred to as, as the habits of mind which led us to talk about when, where the habits of mind come from, right? They, come, they came from a bunch of you know, thinkers getting together and talking and so on and so forth, which means it, it, it just supports what you folks said, that it, that it goes across domains. And we might be talking different languages, but we all come to the same conclusion. So, um, so, so anyway, so one of the things that, that, that we're starting um, to do, and we ha I, I started because I presented a paper on it and I submitted another abstract, is to try and determine what people in our field, number one, think, think you know, the, which habits could be most useful so in, in the field, to get some type of consensus, right? Which leads into a couple of the other questions on the scavenger hunt. So that's that's where we're at there. Uh, if there be other questions, I'll just to add, uh, one of the reasons to come from a content basis is that there are histories to the content. So 
if you're in a professional development workshop where you're working with a content specialization, is say if it was science education, um, science education has had the scientific habits of mind since almost the turn of the 19th century. So they're going to have a perspective of, of possibly bringing in an understanding of scientific habits of mind through both thinking skills and values and cultural values of uh, science community. So more recently, through uh, from Dewey in the 1920s and 30s, through to the current movement in the 16 Habits of Mind, this has been a developmental historical context which scientific habits of mind have been right there and it's very much part of the community in the AAAS, for example, uh, documents from the 90s when the first standards um, changes were made in science education after the um, discovery of how poorly we were doing in science. So unless you bring an historical and philosophical uh, point of view in a discipline like science, uh, you would be presenting the idea of scientific habits of mind and where students would be able to, uh, teachers would be able to link to this uh, traditions of scientific habits of mind. Uh, I think you uh, would miss an opportunity where I think a lot that was done previously starting uh, with Dewey and others um, can influence why it's so important to include habits of mind in a community approach across disciplines, inclusive of individual disciplines. So that, that was my perspective, um, which started off with um, question number one, which is someone else's domain or not tackling those kinds of things. All right, question four. Sorry. 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 Question oh, four. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, but I was, I was what I was just doing was I was uh, I was trying to um, conceptualize what Erskine and Mickey said about I was looking at the diagram of the, the core outcomes to see how that would. I'm very visual, so I, I wanted to see how that would be, and I was showing showing my my friends over here. All right, so number four, um, why do you call them habits? Are they the same as values? And what's the relationship with these habits to teaching them? Um, is habit the same as, is habit of mind uh, the same as character education? And the, the reason um, that, that, that I pondered this is because I really had to think about it. And, and um, so, I was just wondering, while, while you folks were doing it, if you, the, the, the process of your thought patterns that, that went into it and what you came up with. Yeah, George and I thought, talked about this this morning, too. <clears throat> and I brought up the idea that values have, is a kind of a dichotomy. It's the character education or the tribe, that's what I remember from way back when. Virtue versus, you know, a value is something we, by a def another definition, is something that we embrace. It's part of our culture. We have certain values, like George was just saying, with the science. So I think possibly the reason that question came up was to make that distinction between a, a character type education versus a value is something that we embrace and that it's part of a culture and it's it's part of what we part of um, our thinking skills. It's a good thing. Do you want to build on that? Same thing. We I think as educators and just the way I don't know maybe we approach things similarly, but the same thing. I kind of look more at definitions of the terms. What do values mean? What do habits mean? What is character education? So for us, we had to kind of define, like you're saying, exactly what are those things first. And it kept coming back to habits and, again, <laughs> going back to the book, but the level of development of any kind of education, you know, the awareness level and the all the way up to the skillfulness level, and that's what habits are, that pattern of behavior. So it's a pattern of intelligent behavior, 
that you have to reach a level of skillfulness to get there. And so that's how I see habits. So you can value habits. They can be part of character education. But I guess, um, you know, like Kathy, like you're saying, that you talked about what are values before we even got to our habits of mind, the same as character education and values. Because sometimes character education, I know, used to have a negative connotation. To something. That's how I felt this question was saying it. But I think we need to make the distinction between the between the two and what how we would operationally define values right. versus and that that this is skillful thinking and successful problem solving, like you're saying, and making things that thinking visible, which maybe is part of character education. I, I I'm not as familiar with character education. I really struggle with it. You start thinking about, for example, managing your impulsivity. <laughs> right. That's so character, character education. Exactly. Yeah. But I, what you said about the notion that when you talk about values, and I, I'm not familiar enough with everything to weigh in, but it sounds to me like when you talk about values, there's always this, you know, split. There's a good, bad. There's a right, wrong. There's a yes, no. But when you talk about habits of mind, it's it's not about method necessarily as it is about practice, personal practice. So my problem solving and my managing my impulsivity looks like this. Whereas your managing your it looks like that. So it's not right nor wrong, but it just is. And so there is a part of a practice that I embody. There's a part of practice that you embody, but we're both doing the same things. And so when you use the term values and you examine things from a character perspective, it's it's placing a judgment on them. Okay, I like that perspective.